Alice Springs Airport just arrived from Adelaide and to our delight there's a pool and an area of trees in the car park here and birds drinking. There's zebra finches, diamond doves and white plumed honey eaters. So it's a good start to our trip here in the Red Centre. Alice Springs is the base and the Red Centre is basically deserts around around Alice Springs. But in the deserts in the southwest, there's wonderful, scenic, world famous geological structures, Uluru and Olgas. And closer to Alice Springs is the McDonald Ranges. They go in an east-west direction for about 400 kilometers and have spectacular scenic gorges and waterholes. And some of these waterholes are permanent, so the birds can cope with the extreme su dry summers that are up here. And the habitat you find in the ranges along the cr dry creek beds, you get the river red gums and elsewhere it's mainly the spinifex grass, the triodia. And many birds are dependent on this habitat, including spinifex birds, spinifex pigeon, and on the slopes where there's spinifex, you find the dusky grass wren. Also you see finches in these spinifex, particularly the painted finch. Away from the ranges in the arid landscape, the habitat you find there is mulga trees, Acacia ranura, and this tree is adapted to the extreme conditions. Thornbills and honey eaters feed in these trees, and we particularly like to see the grey honey eater that feeds in the mulga trees, along with the slaty back thornbill. And further south, where it's more arid gibber plains, we hope to see the banded whiteface. Even though the desert is fairly harsh and dry in these conditions, after rain, it all changes. Eremophilus flower, grasses grow, and it looks greener, and there's more insects, and there's many nomadic birds arrive and breed, and some birds that we'd like to see are the honey, nomadic honey eaters like the pied, black, and also the zebra finches and budgies start breeding in these boom times when there's good rains. Also up here you see lots of parrots, so they are likely to breed after rain. Some parrots we like to see the ringneck, the mulga, the burke, and the major Mitchell. So there's lots of birds to see and we're really looking forward to getting out there. The town of Alice Springs lies at the heart of the Red Centre on the site of the old telegraph station. It's a great base from which to explore the various habitats of this huge area. A good introduction is to visit Olive Pink Botanic Gardens. We've spotted Pallid Cuckoo, a large, pale, open country cuckoo which feeds mainly on hairy caterpillars. And there's the constant chatter of gregarious grey-crowned babblers, the largest Australian babbler. I can hear that five-note call of the red-browed pardalo over there, so... I can't see it, but go and see if we can find it. Red-browed is the largest pardalote, with a thickish bill, and spends most of its time in the upper canopy of eucalypts, gleaning insects and lerp, but tunnels its nest into earth or sandbanks. Well, I can hear, hear the bowerbird, the western bowerbird, so we'll go and see if we can find the bowerbird's bow. Now we've found the bower of the male bowerbird. Now the western bowerbird makes an avenue bower and he puts twigs up and he paints them and he constantly spends all his time decorating his decorating this bower and making a platform in front of it. And in this case he's got lots of white objects placed out the front. And he fiercely defends this bower and meanwhile He's hoping that a female will come along and he'll turn his neck and display his pink nape to hopefully get a successfully mate in the bower. Next morning, 
morning we're off to explore the dry bed of the Todd River. It rarely flows, but inundations can come within a few hours and cause extensive flooding. As a result, it supports huge ancient river red gums and many bird species. Black kite is the most common of several raptors lining the banks. Crimson chats are adaptable in their breeding cycle and highly nomadic in search of food. They're mainly ground feeders, with the male in particular being brightly coloured and conspicuous. A common bird we're seeing is the Mallee ringneck, or it's the, it's the Port Lincoln ringneck up in the Alice area, and this is the western subspecies with a black head and a yellow belly, and it doesn't have a red frontal bar. It's similar to the 28 in the southwest of Western Australia, but that's a bigger bird and it has a red frontal mark, frontal mark and a black head, but it has a green underbelly. Now the eastern race, Barnardi as it's called, has a pale head and an orangey belly and also has a red frontal bar. But then the Cloncurry subspecies around Mount Isa and Cloncurry, that is very much green and yellow and, and has a yellow belly and no frontal, red frontal bar. And because it's a green head, it's yellow ring neck doesn't, oh, doesn't show up as much. We're getting, getting a good look at the Port Lincoln ring neck. Black falcon is endemic to Australia. It's the largest Australian falcon, but sparsely distributed, and favours this riparian habitat where it breeds. It takes small birds, mammals and insects, occasionally stealing prey from other raptors. As the day heats up, it's a good idea to head for water, so it's off to the sewage ponds. As the only extensive area of water for hundreds of square kilometres, it attracts all manner of water birds. Its proximity to the dump also makes it a good place to find raptors. An exquisite sight. This raptor is more interested in cruising over the water than the adjacent dump. Its low, leisurely flight, obvious white rump, and large, upswept wings mark it as swamp harrier. beside the West Macdonald Ranges and we hope to get to Glen Helen and stay overnight so we can spend tomorrow looking around Ormerson Gorge. On the way we're going to call into permanent water holes and see if we can see the painted finch and spinifex pigeon. Oh there's a raptor. And well worth pulling over for a good sighting of this magnificent black-breasted buzzard with the unmistakable large white bullseye markings on the underwings. We're turning off into Simpson's Gap. These trees along the way are worth checking for small birds. And here's the smallest of all, Weebill. Short, stubby beak, but a loud, distinctive call. These gorges are also a good place for reptiles. Back on the road heading west, following the spine of the McDonald Ranges, until we turn off to Serpentine Gorge, where a permanent waterhole is a lifesaver for wildlife of all kinds, 
including flies. Little crows know it can offer good pickings and it can be a rewarding place to watch for birds. Seed eaters like finches need to drink almost hourly in extreme heat and flocks keep coming, though cautiously. Most numerous are zebra finches. Adolescents have black beaks which become bright orange in adulthood with adult males having matching orange cheek patches lacking in both females and adolescents. A bowerbird has come in to drink, momentarily scattering the flock of smaller birds. Maybe he has a bower nearby. He seems to have a proprietary interest. Noisy chattering and the brief flashing green and gold of Australia heralds the budgie's arrival. They're rapid, nervous drinkers, sometimes immersing their heads and ladling the water down in quick gulps, ready for a swift takeoff. The dainty diamond dove is the smallest Australian dove with a distinctive red eye ring. Painted finches are a colourful finch of the arid interior with fine pointed bills for feeding mainly on spinifex seeds. They live in small flocks in dry rocky areas around permanent water holes. Beautiful. Captivating little spinifex pigeons are approaching. Superbly adapted to this harsh habitat, like diamond doves, they can feed in the fiercest heat of the day, thus avoiding raptors. Within a week or so of hatching, they can fly and forage to take utmost advantage of sporadic breeding opportunities after rains. Perfectly camouflaged too. Whoa, what's beside us? We've been too entranced with pigeons to notice this parenti coming out of a rock crevice behind us. It's too close and far too big to get into one frame. The largest monitor lizard in Australia, it can run at over 30 kilometers per hour. We're only too happy for this rare opportunity to keep very still and watch this magnificent reptile as it drinks copiously, then makes its ponderous way back into the rock, serenely unperturbed by our human presence. Bird watching can spring some wonderful surprises, but the birds have become strangely quiet since the appearance of this huge predator. So reluctantly, we've decided to leave for Glen Helen. The road follows the head of the Fink River, an ancient desert river of 600 kilometers, which provides a permanent but largely invisible water table along its length. However, at Glen Helen, it has eroded a gorge across layers of sandstone and a deep hole where the water has squeezed through a narrow gap. It's a reliable habitat for plants, fish, birds and travellers seeking a green oasis. Next morning we're visiting Ormiston Gorge, a spectacular place with a near permanent waterhole and an abundance of wildlife. The colourful little mistletoe bird is a perfect example of symbiosis, eating the mistletoe berries which it later evacuates coated in a sticky substance along a host tree branch which ensures the growth of more of its parasitic food plant. Grass wrens occur only in Australia and usually in fairly inaccessible places. We're scouring the triodia covered rocky slopes here for dusky grass wren. Happily, this is one of the easier grass wrens to find and in this perfect habitat, we can watch them bouncing around on the rocky slopes from the less prickly track. The track is part of the well-used Larapinta Trail. So this very confiding spinifex pigeon feeding on triodia seeds in front of us seems entirely comfortable. A hot, steep climb to the ghost gum lookout is well worth it. There are stunning views of the gorge and a rare chance to enjoy watching raptors from above as they ride the thermals. Red Banks is the last gorge to explore before turning south. It took us a while to recognise this guttural chuck, so different from the bellbird's usual musical ventriloquial call. This lightly timbered habitat is just right for robins to perch and dart to feed. Hooded robin gets its name from the male's black cap. The female is dull grey. 
Similarly, the smaller red-capped robin male has far more vivid colouring than his mate. We're leaving the magnificently dramatic McDonnell Ranges and turning onto the unsealed Marini Loop to Kings Canyon. We'll be passing Goss Bluff, one of the world's most significant comet impact sites, a huge crater created around 130 million years ago. There it is to the west. Passing thick stands of desert oak to a high point, we sight the rugged George Gill Range and enter Wataka National Park. We're heading to our accommodation, where dingoes are common, but they never hurry. Kathleen Springs has water, perching trees for raptors and thick undergrowth for smaller birds. The arid country red-backed kingfisher is common here. It feeds mainly on small reptiles. This is a more typical sighting of crested bellbird, foraging on the ground for invertebrates and seeds. They're usually solitary, except in breeding season. Rainbow bee eaters are a spectacular, colourful sight as the sun sets on our first night in Wataka. Next morning, it's important to set out as early as possible to avoid the heat for the climb up and around Kings Canyon. The 100 metre towering walls have been sliced through two ancient layers of sandstone. The views are breathtaking and the geological formations amazing. The top layer of marini sandstone is porous and has stored quantities of fresh water, which is slowly released to produce permanent springs and water holes and supports many species of plants and animals. It's prime habitat for painted finch. The flowering shrubs and shallow pools are attractive to many species of honey eater. The water flows into Kings Creek at the base, forming an ideal drinking spot for painted finch. The female has less red on face and belly than the darker male, but both are strikingly beautiful birds and it's delightful to watch this flock interacting. There's the distinctive call of black-chinned honeyeater. They're foraging in eucalypt foliage. This northern race, golden-backed, is particularly lovely. Even more so than the nominate southern race. Generally uncommon, we've been lucky to come across this small feeding party in its preferred habitat along a watercourse. A long hot walk but thrilling sights. Driving to Uluru next day, passing sand dunes with an understory of spinifex and dense stands of desert oak, their tough cones are an adaptation to tolerate fire and regenerate. The country changes as we head southwest, becoming less fertile, but still supporting a good covering of plants and wildlife, which invites many stops, always inspecting mulga for the very rare grey honeyeater and other small birds. A raptor that prefers arid environments, the graceful and pretty spotted harrier is also on the hunt for small birds and mammals. Cocktail and Rufus Rump indicate this small bird could be in Lanthornbill, confirmed by its dark red eye and faintly streaked breast. Certainly not a grey honey eater. No trouble with ID of this landmark, and we just have time for a walk around the base before sunset. We're keen to go farther west, passing the majestic Catatajuta, formerly the Olgas, along the dusty red road always on the lookout for grey honey eater. We've spotted the brilliant gold flower of a desert grevillea, certainly worth a look, and feeding on it is grey fronted honey eater, named for a small area of grey on its forehead. It's not one of the most aptly named of Australia's honey eaters, but the black border on its yellow neck plume is a distinguishing feature. We're scrutinising every small bird in the mulga, 
but the call of Western Jerigone is unmistakable and reinforced by seeing the bold black and white tail pattern. Mulga habitat is dominated by ants and the mounds of mulga ants are everywhere, built as a bulwark against transient flooding. Vocal and confiding, this flitting grey fantail is giving us great views. Though common all over Australia, this is the subspecies albicorda of the desert areas, named for its white tail, which looks proportionately longer to that of the larger nominate race. Another spectacular tail, variegated fairy wren, is the most widespread of Australia's nine fairy wren species. This male of the inland subspecies Assimilus is gloriously colourful in breeding plumage. Unfortunately, there are now about 1.2 million feral camels in the Australian desert, destroying habitat and competing with native animals for scarce resources, especially water. We're returning for our last night at the rock. Leaving Uluru and heading for Aldunda, we've spotted a small flock of Major Mitchell's cockatoos, subspecies Mollus, a beautiful, delicately coloured pink and white cockatoo found in the arid inland only where large trees are present to provide nesting holes. Its crest lacks the yellow of the nominant race. Uldunda is a pleasant settlement at the junction with the main Stewart Highway and a good place to spend the night after a long drive. Heading north on the highway to Alice, where sadly there's plenty of roadkill for Australia's largest bird of prey, wedge-tailed eagle. With a wingspan of over two metres, it's one of the world's largest eagles and is found throughout Australia and southern Papua New Guinea. Its dark colouring indicates this is an adult and we've disturbed his breakfast. The wedge-shaped tail is easily seen in flight as this magnificent bird soars off. We're looking for much tinier birds in this arid, open scrubland. This is the favoured habitat of two white-faced species. Here's the more common and widespread southern whiteface. And to our delight, feeding nearby a small party of the difficult to locate banded whiteface. That's the piping call of male pied honeyeater. Surprising since these are highly nomadic following rains and it's been fairly dry. Whoops, chased by spiny cheeked honeyeater, while its plain coloured female partner perches nearby. Orange Creek still holds some precious water. Australian pipit has a characteristic bobbing motion. The extreme heat has brought in a very thirsty male crimson chat. Chats are mainly insect eaters, but do have brushed tongues so they can take nectar. On the final stretch back to Alice, we're planning an early night so we can drive before dawn next day down the Santa Teresa Road for Burke's Parrot. This was a well-known site for rufous-crowned emu wren, but has since been burned out. Fortunately, we found it on a previous visit. The smallest Australian bird by weight, with a thin, faint call, it takes a still morning, a lot of searching, painfully pricked with legs and some luck to locate it in this ideal habitat with plenty of places to feed, hide and nest. Its name derives from the filamentous tail resembling emu plumes. Rufus crowned is the smallest of the three emu wren species and the most colourful. We're off before sunrise down Santa Teresa Road towards a dam for a chance to see the shy, softly coloured Burke's parrot which drinks briefly at dawn and dusk. Just made it. And now, as the day heats up, the flocks come in. Crested pigeons are first. Much larger than spinifex pigeons, this species has spread from the arid inland to the coast. Galahs are also familiar to most Australians, active, noisy and very playful, with their own subtly coloured beauty, especially with raised crest. Usually found in flocks, this lone male orange chat may be looking to establish a breeding territory. Zebra finch flocks stay as close to the water source as possible to limit the time they're exposed during their repeated attempts to drink. And no wonder, 
since raptors are constantly watching, like this Australian hobby, a small but fierce fast falcon, which flashes over, looking to knock one out of the air. The edge of water is the edge of life and death in the outback. The finch's only safety is in numbers and the shelter of scrubby vegetation, but their urgent need for water always makes them vulnerable. Banded lapwings prefer sparsely vegetated, often seemingly barren arid habitat, where they can forage without impediment, but they also need to drink regularly. Their larger size offers greater protection from birds of prey, but they're still wary and always post a lookout to give a warning call. Cockatiels are small grey cockatoos, almost as noisy as budgies, and equally nervous. They circle many times, almost landing, before alighting to snatch a hurried drink, scooping up water with the lower mandible before swiftly wheeling off. They have to drink at least once a day, but like other seed eaters, they minimise their risks with speed, staying in flocks and keeping constantly on the move. One of the great joys of Outback Australia is to see a flock of budgies coming in to drink, a swirl of green and gold. They can risk drinking for only the briefest of moments, epitomising the precarious existence of so many of the inhabitants of this harsh environment. On the way back to Alice, we hear the distinctive call of red-tailed black cockatoo, the only black cockatoo of the arid interior. Time to stop and have a look around. Good, there's some mature spinifex, and weaving deftly through is a small warbler, spinifex bird, which feeds on insects and seeds, and sometimes sings from perch to defend territory. Chiming wedgebill is a skulker, but can be located by its repetitive song, which could drive you a little crazy. An early start up the Tanami track to Cunnoth Bore, another scarce water source in the dry Mulga area, where parrots come to drink in the relative coolness of dawn and dusk. It's an opportunity to see colourful Mulga parrots before they fly off to rest and feed during the heat of the day. Most often in pairs, the female with a more muted colouring. We're still searching through endless mulga for grey honey eater, and lerps are a favoured food source, when a familiar sound heralds the arrival of a small busy flock of varied satella, black-capped piliata race, spiralling headfirst down tree trunks, gleaning insects. Another small bird, another thornbill, chestnut rumped with plain breast and white scalloped forehead, the commonest and most wide-ranging of inland thornbills with a distinctive white iris. Slaty-backed is less common with red eye and black streaked crown and often feeds with inland thornbills. Turning off along Hamilton Downs Road, we spot black-eared cuckoo, largest of the bronze cuckoos. It prefers arid habitats. And flying overhead is the largest cuckoo shrike, ground cuckoo shrike, also widespread across inland Australia and mainly a ground feeder. Patrolling the mulga back near the boar, we're delighted to come across resting Burke's parrot, giving us much better views than the previous brief glimpse we had in the poor pre-dawn light, and even better when they come down to feed. But we're still looking for that inconspicuous, quiet, and to us almost mythical honey eater, could this be it? Tiny with grey upper parts, uniform white underparts with a grey wash across the breast, brown eye and a definite short pointed, slightly decurved bill. At last. Surely one of the most nondescript birds ever to cause such rejoicing. <laughs>